thank you very much, Dr. Prabhashini Kumari Hami, for arranging this, uh, along with our honorary secretaries, Dr. Chanaka Biratna and Dr. Chira Biriyanagi. Our first resource person today is Dr. Anuradha Kolamagi, MBBS MD, consultant physician based hospital Tedinia. He'll be speaking on a man with jaundice and drowsiness, not the usual suspects. Over to you, Anuradha. Come. Thank you very much, dear yes, sir, uh, for your kind introduction. And thank you very much for giving us uh, this. Uh, actually, uh, this is a learning opportunity for us, actually, uh, from the beginning to the end. I think this is a learning opportunity. So we take it as a learning opportunity. Um, and uh, please let me share uh, uh, one of uh, our uh, patient management experience with you. Um, Thursday is not working. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm going to uh, present a, a patient like who is 35 year old male now who you know, the actually bystander gave the history. Uh, he, he admitted with uh, fever for uh, three days. Uh, He admitted with fever for three days and vomiting four to five episodes per day for three days, black color stools for three days, no dark color or blood stain vomiting. And um, the another complaint was like he was like very responsive and oral intake was reduced. And his behavior was uh, altered since morning. He was admitted to the hospital at 1 p.m. actually. So uh, by the look of it, like it looks like uh, the uh, the met the the Melina with the sepsis. Uh, I just uh, uh, talk along the uh, sides. His body weight is around eighty kilogram. His oxygen saturation on admission was ninety two. Respiratory rate. It was 30 uh, pulse 106, blood pressure is 106 or 60. Temperature was high. Uh, GCS uh, E4, B3, M4. Uh, it was uh, 11. Random glucose was high. He was ectatic and he had bilateral ankle edema up to knee joints. And there was moderate hypotrophy in So uh, now, a few more things uh, came up. We did the venous blood gas. The pH was 7.47, sodium 127. Lactate was high and the hemoglobin was 4.5. ECG, there was sinus tachycardia. So, this patient... Uh, The information we got from bystander, and he had a medical records, and he had a um, established history of he's a 34 year old man, established liver cirrhosis with uh, chronic active hepatitis, and he had uh, documented uh, he was like there was a document that he had elevated IgG and positive ANA. Information regarding upper GI endoscopy was not available and he's not an alcohol consumer. The, there was no information on medication compliance. So we detected few problems. So likely upper GI bleeding because there's a history of dark color stools uh, and possible infection the elevated lactate may be due to several causes. And we thought the elevated random glucose was due to stress response, actually. 
So our provisional diagnosis was hepatic encephalopathy with the given history of uh, chronic hepatitis, uh, autoimmune hepatitis uh, with established cirrhosis. And uh, we thought it was precipitated by sepsis and the upper GIP. So stress hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia in critical ill patients may be due to elevated cortisol, catecholamines, glucagon, and growth hormone. Those are stress hormones, as we know, and increased gluconeogenesis as a result, glycogenolysis. There may be insulin resistance as well. The, the, our patient had was actually like 80 kilo, more than 80 kilograms by his body weight, actually, maybe partly contributing the, the uh, insulin resistance. So we started uh, managing a patient with sepsis and upper GI bleeding in the in the background of uh, CLCD. Uh, the we wanted to give now he was febrile. Uh, we wanted to give IV paracetamol, but it was not available. Um, so the hemoglobin was four point seven in the blood gas. So uh, he needed urgent blood transfusion. So we have started him on like IV teliprasin and IV PPI was started and the liver failure regime. So surgical opinion was taken because there was a suspicion of a, like upper GI bleeding, uh, but uh, they said that he was too ill for the, the endoscopy. And we did a bedside ultrasound at ETU. There was moderate hepatosplenomegaly uh, with increased echogenicity of liver and uh, there were acute renal parenchymal changes actually. So in addition to that left-sided pleural effusion, there was no free fluid in the abdomen. Portal, portal vein, they have not commented on that. We did the inward chest radiograph. There was like apparent cardiomegaly and likely pulmonary congestion because there was haziness. The, those are the investigation as, uh, like uh, uh, we got um, down to the ETU actually, hemoglobin was 4.7, platelet was 94, a white blood cell count is neutrophil leukocytosis with a high WBC of 10.94. Bilirubin was 4.2 and direct bilirubin was 2.2. Uh, AST was higher, 66, and albumin was low, 2.2. Creatinine is 1.5 milligrams per deciliter, uh, uh, mildly increased. CRP was 106. So, and sodium potassium was normal. So, this was like uh, uh, compatible with the, the, our provisional diagnosis. So, we continued our management. So, there was like, uh, and in the evening, like about like, Three hours we have started like him on like blood transfusion, emergency blood transfusion. The patient developed vomiting and oxygen saturation dropped, breathing pattern was altered, and now GCS has been has dropped to eight. So there was possible aspiration. So anesthetist, we uh, decided to uh, intubate the patient. And there was a reasonable urine output, and the patient was transferred to uh, uh, intensive care unit. Now there are new problems to the list, aspiration, acute kidney injury. Uh, we thought about hypotrenal syndrome, but it is unlikely. Uh, likely anemia induced cardiac failure, pericardial effusion. Uh, we suspected and the, 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 the source of sepsis may be coming to acquired pneumonia. We have start, the transfused actually four units of blood and FFP 750 ml. The uh, need for um, NCCT head was considered, but uh, but um, we couldn't do it. Patient is first too ill. We don't have in the head CDs, and uh, we need to transfer him to the uh, national hospital Candy. So at that was at that time it was not possible. So we deferred that. The diagnosis of the hepatorenal syndrome is that is one of 
exclusion actually. The hypotrenal syndrome is very difficult thing to distinguish from prerenal AKI. So we gave more weight to prerenal AKI than hypotrenal in this uh, patient at that time actually. Because there was like, uh, we suspected GI fluid loss because he, she, he presented with like uh, vomiting and, and malina. So, uh, uh, because of that, uh, we, we thought it was more AKI uh, than uh, the hepatorenal, actually. Uh, uh, so, day one in ICU, patient developed uh, like mild uh, endotracheal and oral bleeding. Lactate has now calmed down. Uh, and he's on vasopressors. Uh, blood urea was 134, creatinine is 1.45. The blood urea was about like three times higher from the upper level. The creatinine is mildly elevated. Now it is again coming down from 1.5. Then hemoglobin is six grams per deciliter, despite uh, it was initially 4.7, actually, like uh, despite like transfusion of four units of blood, the hemoglobin is six. INR, we have to again, we had to get it down from the candy. It is a 1.6. And we did an urgent blood picture. Uh, the red cells uh, was like, uh, there were uh, normochromic normocytic cells and target cells, acanthocytes, macrocytes. And there were polychromatic cells and spherocytes as well with uh, mild agglutination. White cell, there were evidence of like sepsis with toxic granules. There was thrombocytopenia. So the comment in the blood picture was anemia of systemic disease, evidence of infection or inflammation, and hemolysis with spherocytes. So, and they have suggested that LDH and the, 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 to, to find the evidence for uh, hemolysis sector. The, actually, we did the that after giving four units. Actually, it is after giving four units of blood, and it came as negative. Uh, with the background, uh, auto the, the um, chronic active hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis. We thought there's a. It is possible that this patient may be having uh, autoimmune hemolytic component. So. Uh, we acted uh, upon it. So uh, this slide is to uh, so some uh, changes in autolemy, whether uh, hemolysis, what you see in hemolysis, critical and laboratory features. And we, we thought the possibility of autoimmune hemolysis, and uh, uh, we wanted to start steroids. And there was a suspicion of upper GI bleed with possible gastric ulceration. And there's a sepsis. So with that uh, two things in mind, with the background of autoimmune hepatitis, so we took the decision to start steroids. So this was our impression at that time. So we, we started folic acid, intravenous hydrocortisone was started. And uh, because uh, there was EDT bleeding, oral bleeding, and the anesthetist suggested to start IV tranexamic acid, we agree. So now we have, we have a, another new diagnosis to the picture. This is a, uh, uh, just to refresh our knowledge about autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, most common type is warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, and we detected we detected uh, using direct agglutination, direct antiglobulin testing, and indirect antiglobulin testing. Uh,
this is to uh, for the completeness uh, uh, we have added to the presentation some of the blood pictures normal blood pictures and compared with the, the peripheral blood smear in autoimmune hemolytic anemia where we can see uh, the spherocytes and approximately 50 to 60 percent of warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is associated with an underlying condition remainder is classified as primary the underlying condition generally produces some combination of immune activation immune deficiency or immune dysregulation associated associated conditions are many so there can be infections, autoimmune disorders such as SLE, lymphoproliferative disorders like lymphoma, MGUS, and there can be immunogenic deficiency, pregnancy, and there is a huge list of medications uh, with the, with, which, is, which is associated with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. This is the, for the completeness okay. And our patient had negative debt, which is uncommon, presenting less than 5% in AIHA, warm AIHA. That's what the book says. The negative debt may be due to characteristics of the autoantibodies that make them more difficult to detect or due to a reduced number of autoantibodies on the surface of RBC. So I think the hematologist is there. They say additional testing is needed. Day two in ICU. Now, uh, to recap, patient presented with likely acute liver failure, uh, precipitated by fee, uh, sepsis and upper GI bleeding. And day two, in the evening, we suspected there is autoimmune component to the low hemoglobin, and we started steroids. Uh, day two, I see you that there are new reports available. LDH was elevated, which is compatible with the hemolysis theory, and the ESR was high. The culture reports were available. The urine culture and blood culture were negative. Day three, even though there was like history of melina, bubbles were not open still, despite lactulose. Fever is still present. The oxygen requirement comes down. Patient opens eye, open, oh, patient is opening his eyes, but patient is irritable. There's still encephalopathy. The hemoglobin was 7.3. Now, we continue transfusion, actually. Platelet was 72, white blood cell was 10.26. Uh, HT, ALT, HT was 91, ALT was 34. Creatinine has come down, urea has come down, and CRP was 81. And uh, the, if you go to the, the, the temperature chart, the temperature spikes has come down, and and there are some arrows going down as well. This is his ECG on admission. There was a right mandible branch block and sinus tachycardia with the uh, prolonged PR interval. And on day four, the ECG uh, the ECG shows sinus bradycardia with the possible non-specific ST segment changes and maybe U waves. So, and there was hypothermia, bradycardia, and patient has not yet opened the bowels, even though there was a history of uh, the, the melina. So we suspected, um, we suspected possible uh, uh, thyroid dysfunction uh, with the history of his uh, autoimmune background.
and we did uh, now patient is afebrile afebrile uh, the arousable peripheral cyanosis sinus bradycardia and tsh we did tsh actually it was 29 uh, and it was elevated and he he passed on day four large very large amount of like stools dark color stools uh, actually it was smelly now So hypothyroidism was considered and hypokalemia due to multiple factors. Lactate rise may be due to poor peripheral circulation and they are smelly now. And we have started him on thyroxine and intravenous hydrocortisone was con continued and potassium replaced and other uh, general management was uh, like continued. And again, now we considered that there is a a likely component of uh, mixed edema coming into the picture, precipitated by acute illness and poor medication adherence. Uh, this is a few words about mixed coma. Mixed coma is defined as severe hypothyroidism leading to decreased mental status, hypothermia, and symptoms related to slowing of function in multiple organs. That may be the reason now he was there was a delay in passing stools for four days, even though he presented with the history of dark color stools plus hypokalemia. Uh, it can be precipitated by an acute event in poorly controlled hypothyroid patients, such as infection, myocardial infarction. It can occur in patients who have any of the usual causes of hypothyroidism, and they have mentioned particularly chronic autoimmune thyroiditis. Despite the name of myxedema coma, patients frequently do not present in coma, but do manifest lesser degree of altered consciousness. The hallmark of myxedema coma are decreased mental status and hypothermia. But hypotension, bradycardia, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, and hypoventilation are often present as well. This usually takes the form of confusion with lethargy and obtundation. Alternatively, a more activated presentation may occur with pro prominent psychotic features, so-called myxedema madness. Untreated patients will progress to coma. So day, day five, so now we, we got another diagnosis into the picture now. So we started hormone replacement. Uh, uh, then day five, the, there was evidence of resolving left basal pneumonia. Uh, hemoglobin was stable. Uh, day six, his GCS is improving. The pulse rate is still 49, but not on mesopresses now. Now, uh, he's, he started passing normal bowels, actually. Hemoglobin was 9.1. The, the day seven, now his central line was removed. Actually, he was the extubated on day four. Uh, central line was removed. Uh, and GCS has improved to 15. Uh, the echocardiogram we did, uh, and ejection fraction was reasonable, and there was a thin rim of pericardial effusion. And on day 18 ICU, the, he again started passing loose tools. We thought it was antibiotic associated. And we decided to take him to the ward, step down him to the ward. Uh, white blood cells, hemoglobin are stable. Creatinine has come down. Direct fraction of bilirubin was 3.5, whereas the total was 7.7, .7. uh, so there's a 
increase in indirect bilirubin. Total protein was 6.5, the albumin was 2.4. Again, there is an increase in uh, globulin fraction. So we stopped antibiotic catheter removal and started him on like uh, the oral steroids after stopping IV hydrocortisone actually. And his uh, lab investigations were negative. FC, HIV, uh, HIV was actually awaiting, FC was negative. And day 11 on in medical ward, uh, we send patient for the like hematologist opinion and and she in there she repeated the blood picture and confirmed uh, that there is an immune hemolysis and he asked us to continue oral steroids and on day 12 the patient was discharged uh, home with outpatient hematology, gastroenterology, and medical follow-up, and the uh, and we wanted to um, uh, uh, we considered actually other possibilities, and we considered uh, uh, other investigations to be done, including thyroperoxidase antibodies, thyroglobin, um, and so on, to uh, confirm or refute or support the. Uh, diagnosis of uh, autoimmune thyroiditis and uh, we plan ultrasound uh, neck. Uh, we plan uh, ultrasound uh, abdomen departmental one uh, and we, uh, we uh, plan to like actually referrals were made to uh, uh, gastroenterologist in National Hospital Candy as to the, the hematologist. Uh, to arrange the follow-up and he will be like, followed up in our unit as well. Um, so that is the case, actually the everything else is theory part. Uh, um, that's, that's, that's what actually I wanted to share with you at the moment uh, due to the time constraints. Uh, uh, I'll skip those slides and uh, The challenges we had actually, I think it is worth mentioning. Patient defaulted the tertiary center follow up. Now, now that's and he ended up in our ETU, and we we didn't have some of the investigations we wanted to do actually, like alkaline phosphatase, gamma GT. Even INR is not done in our hospital. The, the brain imaging was difficult to get it done. And there is there is non availability of some medications and blood products like IV albumin, IV paracetamol, IV thyroxine, and there was non availability of emergency endoscopy services. Like I will give you a summary: uh, a 34 year old male who had defaulted medical follow up for biopsy proven cirrhosis with chronic active hepatitis, admitted to emergency room with acute febrile illness upper GI bleeding and clinical features suggestive of acute liver failure. He was in circulatory shock. The patient was intubated and transferred to ICU. There was no expected rise in level of hemoglobin despite appropriate blood and blood product support. Then with the aid of hematological and laboratory investigation, presumed autoimmune hemolysis was diagnosed and started him on IV steroids. And along the course of the present illness, he was clinically diagnosed with myxedema and appropriate hormone replacement instituted. Clinically, the patient was presented with acute failure, acute liver failure due to autoimmune hepatitis, precipitated by a febrile illness and an upper GI bleed. Later, during the clinical course, he was found to have extrahepatic associations of the disease, namely AIHA and chronic immune type autoimmune thyroiditis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Amlal Gurbari. And um, I could have introduced him at the beginning now that with the Uh He's a consultant vision at Base Hospital, Tendinia, since January 2022. 
to obtain this MBBS with the second class from Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniri, in 2004, and received this MD in Medicine from University of Colombo, 2011. Dr. Kolumbagi completed his overseas training in respiratory medicine, uh, general medicine, and acute medicine at Luton and Dunsdale Hospital, UK, from February 2014 to February 2016. Thank you very much, Dr. Kolumbagi, for uh, sharing your experiences. They now, uh, when the postgraduates do their uh, the appointments in Colombo, they don't understand the, the, the difficulties that they have to undergo when they are posted elsewhere. So uh, this is where we learn the role of the peripheral physician. And thank you very much again, Dr. Colombo again. And this is a small token of appreciation. So we don't take exceptions. Yes. Our next speaker is Dr. Visaka Rajapaksa, MBBS MD, a consultant clinical hematologist at District General Hospital, Naval PTA, also covering base hospital Dikkoya, base hospital Gampala, and teaching hospital Peradinia. She obtained an MBBS from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Sri Javadapura, and received an MD from the University of Colombo. She completed the overseas training at Bangor Hospital, UK, and received special training in bone marrow transplant at Christie Hospital, Manchester, UK. She was a board certified as a specialist in clinical hematology in 2018. The topic that she has chosen for today is thrombocytopenia. Need the pause and reflect. Over to you, Dr. Vishagaraj Thank you very much, Elisa. Uh, yes, uh, good evening. So I'm uh, attached to uh, District General Hospital now. Uh, so this is a map uh, for you to see where now is located. So uh, it's here. So this hospital uh, I'm working in Central Province. Uh, it's for about uh, 40 kilometers away from the Kennedy. So I do covering up uh, base hospital. It's about 70 kilometers away and also uh, base hospital Gampala and teaching hospital uh, Peradeniri as well. So working in peripheral hospital is quite challenging with limited facilities. So I thought to share my uh, some experience. So my today's uh, topic is thrombocytopenia. Uh, so uh, working in peripheral hospital, so if we see a full blood count with severe thrombocytopenia, uh, with uh, massive bleeding or with uh, emergency surgery, so it's a big challenge for our doctors because we don't have uh, platelets in our peripheral hospitals. Okay, so we have a small blood bank. Uh, it's available only few uh, red cells, FFP, and platelets. If there is a massive transfusion or in emergencies, we don't have platelets. Uh, so we have to send ambulance to teaching hospital Peradenia or Candy uh, to get down the platelets. So uh, for ambulance to come back, uh, it takes for minimum of uh, three to four hours in emergency cases. Uh, so I thought to share some experience with uh, how we manage thrombocytopenia in peripheral hospitals with you all. Case number one. A uh, 55 year old farmer uh, admitted to base hospital Gumpola uh, on uh, Christmas Day uh, with high fever and complained body aches for five days duration. And uh, clinical features are suggestive of leptospirosis. So, physician has started treatment for leptospirosis. So, they have done full blood count. You can see he has got severe thrombocytopenia. Uh, so, uh, so, thrombocytopenia in a septic patient, I'm sure you all have seen uh, thrombocytopenia we can expect in septic in ICU or in HDU patient. But according to the physician, uh, that's true he has got uh, infection, bacterial infection with high CRP, but he is not ill that much, uh, not septic looking. So, this severe thrombocytopenia is not compatible for his uh, serious knock of the illness. Okay, so there is no bleeding at all, even with platelet count up. But uh, because of the peripheral hospital in public holidays, and uh, physician can't wait without uh, ordering platelet or a giving platelet because uh, he wanted to wait a complication like a bleeding of this patient. Okay, uh, 
so his uh, question was, is that okay to give a platelet transfusion for this patient even though uh, there's no bleeding manifestation at all? So I wanted to uh, check a blood picture before giving blood product because this history is not uh, significantly compatible with whole blood count report. So this is for you to see the normal morphology of the blood picture. These, um, these uh, purple dots are the platelets. You can see it's evenly distributed throughout the slides. But in uh, these patients, there are so many platelet clumps. Okay, so this is because of the uh, non-specific antibodies in the patient's blood react with the reagents of the sample collecting tube. So you don't have to worry about the antibodies inside the patients because it's not clinically significant at all. Okay, so this is a laboratory error. It caused uh, EDTA induced platelet clumps. So actual platelet count of this patient is normal. Uh, so, uh, you can repeat full blood count using different reagent, maybe citrate or heparin. You might get normal uh, full blood count report in a machine. But sometimes, unfortunately, some antibodies react with other reagents as well. So, in, the, in that case, if you need an actual uh, platelet count, you can arrange finger pick blood sample. Then we can do uh, manual platelet count in the laboratory. Okay, so take on the sage in here. Uh, if uh, your clinical picture is not tally with your full blood count, so please uh, contact laboratory people and uh, please make sure these counts are correct or not. Okay, so what will happen if we give platelet transfusion uh, to a platelet count of 200 or 300 with normal platelet uh, patient? A patient might end up with uh, thrombotic complication like stroke, heart attack, or uh, DVT because, uh, because of the underlying infection, bedridden uh, for a few days. Uh, so, uh, thrombotic complication might be uh, activated. So case number two, I'm sure uh, some of you have might encounter uh, almost all difficult cases uh, admitted in public holidays or midnight or uh, uh, weekends. Uh, that's what our experience in peripheral hospitals, okay? Uh, because uh, very limited uh, human resources available in peripheral hospitals. So this boy, 24 years, admitted to a uh, base hospital big choir on Saturday night. Okay, Admitted with severe hematomasis. On admission, he was pale, and they have done a urgent ultrasound scan, found to have mild splenomegaly, no lymphadenopathy, no hematomegaly. Uh, so they have done urgent uh, full blood count and found severe anemia with thrombocytopenia. So according to the uh, clinical picture and uh, physician uh, thought uh, it could be ITP with acute blood loss because he was otherwise totally normal boy. There was no feature suggestive of underlying malignancy. Uh, so his uh, question was, uh, it's Saturday uh, night, uh, so they have already started red cell transfusion, waiting for basal transfusion. Uh, so is that uh, okay to give high dose of steroids? Otherwise, this platelet might not be increased because we all know in ITP, if we give platelets, that platelets again can be destroyed. But again, uh, I am not usually suggest for platelet trans uh, steroid high dose of steroids. Uh, without know, knowing what is going on, okay? So in emergency, uh, you can use emergency bleeding, you can use IV or tran oral tranexamic acid according to the severity. If there is no contraindication, you can use tranexamic acid in bleeding. And also, placer transfusion is not a contraindication in ITP. If your critical picture is suggest, you can exclude TTP or HUS, uh, then you can uh, transfuse platelet. Uh, yes, if platelets are destroying, uh, you can give platelet with IVIG cover. But still, I recommend uh, better to do an urgent blood picture before starting high dose steroids. So following day, I got down a blood picture slide and 
Uh, his peripheral bulb consists of atypical lymphocytes. So his diagnosis was lymphoma. Uh, so in that case, before we are arranging uh, a bone marrow biopsy, cytometry, or a confirmation test, you can cure red cell transfusion, clinical support, transamicasy, or if patient has an infection, you can start antibiotics. So you have to do a full supportive care until we arrange confirmatory testing uh, afterward. So uh, if you have noticed in full blood count, even though his uh, total white cell was normal, you can see lymphocyte fraction is high. Uh, so even though these young patients, especially lymphomas, they might come uh, without significant uh, features suggestive of underlying malignancy, if we give high dose of lethal steroid cause, these abnormal lymphocytes can be masked because some lymphomas are very sensitive to steroids, uh, then uh, the diagnosis might be missed. So in that case, there is an indication you have to contact the hematology department and confirm or discuss what's going on. Uh, my third case, a young lady, 38 years, previously healthy, presented with excessive PV bleeding. So because of the presenting complaint of PV bleeding, he, she went to a VOG and she, uh, he has done ultrasound scan and found to have endometrial polyp. So uh, VOG has uh, diagnosed or uh, 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 investigate uh, where the bleeding point. They have done full blood count and found severe thrombocytopenia again. So VOG referred to me. So it's clinically ITPV bleeding because they have found the bleeding point. So uh, as uh, is that all right to give uh, steroids? Uh, otherwise, bleeding might not be stopped. So as usual, I want to do a urgent blood picture before advising steroids. Uh, usually it takes for about 20 minutes to get ready urgent aside. So uh, while getting ready the blood picture, I went to see the patient in g -Mod. So looking at her, she was very, very ill. In ITP patients, you all know, primary ITP is exclusion of all, all other causes of thrombocytopenia. But looking at this patient, she was very, very ill. She didn't uh, give a history of fever at all, uh, but she had two episodes of fainting attack in the morning, and she gave a history of severe loss of appetite for last four days, so she couldn't eat or drink last four days in uh, and she was severely dehydrated, tachycardic, so uh, she was very ill. So that uh, clinical picture was not tally uh, with the ITP. So I uh, check the blood picture. So this is for you to see the normal size of the lymphocyte. The normal size uh, is the uh, same as the red cell size, but uh, what happened in her, uh, her lymphocytes uh, were very large with base of the cytoplasm. So looking at her clinical features and morphological findings, so it's, uh, uh, I diagnose it as a dengue fever. So it is, it is a, a atypical presentation of dengue fever. So we referred uh, her to a physician urgently. And uh, at that time, she was in leaking phase. Uh, so uh, with acute management and the physician, she was uh, recovered uh, very quickly. So this is for uh, you to learn about the morphology. So we can see reactive lymphocytes in simple viral infection. So if you give a history like high fever, young patients with bilateral symmetrical lymph node, with this type of morphology, we can uh, diagnose it as an infectious mononucleosis. Uh, so we need uh, a clinical background or features of clinical, then we nicely correlate with morphology of lymphocyte. Then we can nicely guide you what's going on. Uh, then again, this is a typical lymphocyte, so diagnosis of the ill. Uh, so case number four, uh, girl, a 19-year girl, uh, presented with a severe frontal headache, to a physician during her A level. So she uh, this year uh, she had a uh, severe headache just after first uh, uh, paper. So uh, she was treated with uh, migraine uh, at the beginning. Uh, 
so she went home, but uh, the headache was not responding. Uh, so in day three, because of persistent headache, they have done full back count found and found to have thrombocytopenia. So uh, this case was really challenging to a physician because uh, this is uh, during her A levels this year, generally, and she didn't want to admit. Uh, and severe headache is persistent, thrombocytopenia. She wanted to complete her exam. Uh, so, uh, so we uh, arrange uh, urgent uh, full button, uh, urgent blood picture. And uh, this is for you to see. This is the normal size of platelet. In her case, there were large and giant platelets. Uh, these are uh, young platelets and fragments of megakaryocytes. So that shows the bone marrow is producing more and more young platelets, and uh, these platelets are destroyed in periphery, uh, peripheral blood, uh, because of antibodies. So because of thrombocytopenia and persistent headache, they have done urgent CT and found to have a multiple subdural uh, hemorrhage in right frontal, left temporal, and uh, parietal. So anyway, uh, she was managed with IVIG and steroid uh, in our special department, and uh, she uh, completed her A levels uh, this year, and she is recovering up to now. Uh, so in ITP, uh, we don't have to do bone marrow biopsy for uh, all ITP patients. If uh, we think clinically, this is not underlying malignancy or bone marrow infiltration, we can straight for straight. Uh, we can start at steroids. But if you are in any doubt, uh, especially in bicytopenia or pancytopenia, or patient give features suggestive or loss of appetite, loss of weight, or any features suggestive or lymphadenopathy, it's better to do bone marrow biopsy before starting a steroid treatment. And ITP management, it's an individualized management. We can't go uh, for any guidelines. Uh, even with platelet 1 or 2, we don't give a platelet transfusion. We can try with steroid. Uh, if first line uh, treatment fails, we can go for second and third line treatment. Sometimes with uh, uh, even though uh, first line treatment is steroid, some patients come with severe thrombocytopenia, gastric erosion, and malina. If we use steroids, gastric erosion might be well. So always uh, the management should be individualized. Okay, this is uh, my last case. A 19-year boy, uh, again, A-level math student. Uh, he sat for A-level this year, January. He came to me. Uh, to teach in hospital para Daniel last year. Uh, he was born to a consanguineous parent. Uh, he had a white lesion on his tongue for many, many years. So he was uh, taken treatment for several doctors uh, for this uh, tongue problem. He was treated with antifungus, but the lesion was same. So finally, uh, he ended up with uh, OMF uh, consultant. He wanted to arrange tongue biopsy to find out what it is. So they have done a uh, full blood count as a baseline investigation before uh, arranging biopsy and found to have thrombocytopenia. So he was referred to me asking uh, whether they need plate transfusion before tongue biopsy. So looking at patient, I can't explain why this young boy got thrombocytopenia. So all, all the time we have to investigate for the underlying cause. So I have arranged bone marrow biopsy. So this is for you to see the normal uh, cellularity of a bone marrow trephine biopsy of a young man. So you can see uh, his bone marrow trephine is almost empty. So diagnosis was aplastic anemia for this uh, boy. And uh, tongue biopsy came as uh, keratosis without uh, dysplasia. And we have arranged uh, genetic studies and GS panel from India. And uh, it confirmed as uh, this keratosis congenital. So it is a rare uh, aplastic anemia uh, condition. Uh, luckily, uh, he didn't have any severe cytopenia. So he managed doing his level. Uh, without any complication. So we get aplastic anemia in peripheral hospitals, uh, almost all ages. 
but it's very, very difficult to manage if we get young patients and children uh, because uh, they are otherwise uh, very normal patients. Suddenly they get or they present with severe pancytopenia. So after the diagnosis, they have a recurrent hospital admission, transocial dependent, neutropenic sepsis, and leading complications. So it's it's a big challenge for us to counsel them. We have to prepare their mind for all possible complications. They can die anytime with BT because they usually they have severe thrombocytopenia, severe anemia. And another challenge is we have to confirm because the plastic anemia, you all know, it could be inherited or acquired. Then definitely in young patients, we have to exclude inherited uh, before label them as acquired. Uh, so if, uh, for diagnosis of inherited plastic anemia, we have to arrange genetic testing. Those are not available in Sri Lanka. We have to send the fresh sample to India. Then the uh, patient uh, from come to Nawal Pitya or the Koy to Kalabu to send the courier the blood sample. The cost is around two lakhs. So you can imagine most of people they can't afford for the NGS panel. Uh, and uh, bone marrow transplant is a treatment option for most of the uh, plastic anemia for young patients. Again, bone marrow transplant is very, very expensive. It's not available still, it's not available in government sector at the moment. Uh, so uh, they don't have money for bone marrow transplant. Uh, we can try ATG treatment. It's an anti thymocyte globuli. It's a sphere immunosuppression. It's available in MST. It's a very expensive drug. But again, if we give ATG to an inherited aplastic anemia, they will die because it's a severe immunosuppression. So without a diagnosis, without, if we don't have money to do NGS panel, we can't give a trial of ATG, then they can die, they can die if the diagnosis is inherited aplastic anemia. But if we give ATG to acquire aplastic anemia, there's a 60 to 70% chance of survival. So uh, if we get to patients like this, it's uh, very, very challenging for us because we, they don't have money. We have a very limited time because they can die with uh, so many cytopenia complications. Uh, so uh, if we give ATG, then again, we have to give irradiated blood products. Again, we can't manage this patient in peripheral hospital. We have to give irradiated platelets and blood products. Then again, we have to transfer the patient uh, to a, a facility available like teaching hospital there at the end or a camp. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is uh, take home messages uh, to you all. Uh, so you get uh, laboratory report. So as I mentioned in the first report, uh, always check your report is compatible with clinical or not. Uh, because uh, pre-analytical errors or uh, laboratory errors uh, is common all over the world, okay? So don't believe private uh, reports might be correct and government wrong, no, that is always uh, not true. Even in peripheral areas, uh, they don't maintain proper uh, QCs and all in uh, laboratories. Uh, so uh, uh, as I mentioned, pre-analytical errors can happen in any laboratory. So think twice before giving blood products or uh, postponing surgery or uh, taking a major decision. If it is not compatible, please contact laboratory people or please repeat it uh, before uh, doing a major decision to your patient. So always think what is the underlying cause uh, so you have to work out for that and try to avoid unnecessary blood product transfusion. Even with anemia, you can try with uh, hematanine, serithropoietin, and so many other options uh, in according to the underlying cause. Uh, so even with high PT, APTT, you don't have to correct in most of the time if patient doesn't have any bleeding manifestation. So you try your best to avoid blood product transfusion. Think logically and think clinically what you have to do. Uh, and the another thing is uh, always think individualized patient care. Nowadays, patients have, uh, patients have so many social problems, and even the, the areas where I worked, they have they are very poor crowd. Uh, they don't want to stay in hospitals, and they never happy if we uh, tell them um, ask for to uh, can be hospital or teaching hospital care. Then yeah. 
uh, for the further investigation because uh, they can't afford, their relations can't come and see. Uh, so uh, we try our best to manage our patients in peripheral hospital uh, for their request. Uh, so my last request is uh, please communicate hematology lab wherever you need. Discuss your clinical cases uh, with hematologists and laboratory people because uh, morphology, because we can see uh, morphology of blood under microscope and hematologists can be on uh, say your record eye, but uh, definitely we need clinical picture of your patients. So clinical and morphology, we can correlate nicely, then we can guide you nicely. Uh, so please uh, communicate and arrange MDTs and all, then uh, we can improve patient care. Uh, so working in peripheral hospital, I am sure uh, registrars in Colombo, they don't have experience, but uh, after foreign graduates or after uh, becoming a consultant, you might get a chance to work in peripheral hospital. So I'm really enjoying working in peripheral hospital, not like in uh, teaching hospital. We eat together all the time. We are arranging parties, going trips, and really enjoying in working hospital because very limited crowd, only 20 consultants with me. So we all like uh, family together and we uh, transport together. I daily tra travel from uh, Candy to Novela Pitya, so it's uh, a carpool we have. So in a car, we are doing MDT, so all consultants available inside the car, it's one and a half travel. So MDTs and chatting and all, so it's very easy to manage, okay? Even, uh, even though I put a leave or a medical leave, we can't say, uh, if they ask the help, I can't say uh, I'm on leave. Okay, so because it's uh, it's a very friendship, we, we are very friendly. Uh, so all the time we, uh, we help even at midnight, even though I'm leave, uh, we get down uh, blood pictures uh, uh, from our friends and uh, see uh, blood picture at home. So that's how we help in peripheral hospital because we know if we send a sample to a major hospital, it's very, very difficult to get down the report and patient also refuse. Uh, transfer. Uh, so it's very fun working in hosa, peripheral hospitals. Uh, so so uh, please be afraid if you get a transfer to peripheral hospital, you have another uh, good life. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any problem or any questions, you can ask. Uh, thank you very much, Sarkha, for that uh, very interesting lecture. Us, uh, encouraging our companies to come back to Sri Lanka and enjoy life in the peripheral. I know the work is difficult, but life is worth coming back. And you will never enjoy the, the, the friendship that you get in your own country. To so come back in your usual process. And uh, may I give the two speakers to the table? Right. Thank you very much. Why did you do that at TSH? Because, uh, because uh, now there was an uh, issue of uh, established cirrhosis. We yeah, had the histology suggested it was chronic active hepatitis. IgG was elevated and ANA was positive. So it was autoimmune hepatitis. And there was a, in the uh, when we review his medication, we didn't have proper history. Uh, there was a history of uh, the hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism. There was. There was. Yeah. There was. So and but medication adherence was uh, uh, not available, and we didn't get the proper history because patient was unconscious. Bystander issue was not reliable. So then at the beginning, there was tachycardia. There was no feature to suggest hypothyroidism actually. But when fever subsided, fever subsided, patients started to show hypothermia. The temperature goes down, hypothermia and bradycardia. So we thought that this must have been uh, under replacement of thyroxine. So that's why we need this. Right. So when the when the patient comes with uh, cirrhosis, with jaundice, 
We think it's the the, the liver causes yeah. jaundice. Why did you think otherwise? Uh, so initial diagnosis was acute liver failure with hepatic encephalopathy precipitated by sepsis and the and the uh, upper GI So so CLCD has done the thing. That's what our initial thought. The clinical picture was totally compatible with that. Icteric, uh, ankle, the, the edema up to knee joint, and hepatitis splenomegaly. But ultrasound did not show like free fluid. And, and, but the, we have the, the initial hemoglobin was like less than five. We transfused uh, four units of blood during first day. And the second day when we checked, when we checked uh, this, uh, uh, hemoglobin, it was still six. The expected rise of uh, hemoglobin was not there. The, he had a history of like uh, he had a history of uh, malina. The expected rise was not there. So that's what that's that's what prompted us to think about like there was an additional there must have been a should have been a, be an additional cause for this thing. That's why we thought of this. Thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Any any questions from on rather? Not questions. It's uh, it's amazing to see how the uh, Because in a simple APLS, we don't think that much of low platelet. And uh, in uh, her case, actually, uh, we have done a bone marrow biopsy. And uh, platelet and bone marrow was uh, perfectly normal. And uh, she uh, responded very well with uh, IVRG uh, in that case. Uh, in APLS, sometimes uh, APTP might be high and there are no complications. complication. Uh, Definitely, if uh, the diagnosis is not MPP, if patients come with PO only, definitely we have to investigate for young people with APLS. You didn't have to send her for any sort of neurosurgery. It, uh, what happened think, with her? I think uh, she was referred to in the neurosurgery, but it, uh, they advised it's a conservative melanoma. It's a very thin layer of something, and she responded with the six when she completed the evidence as well. Probably she passed. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? And if I can um, now if I if I tell you something now like that as she said now we, we have only eleven consultants in our unit uh, the, in our hospital. So it is a teamwork actually. Teamwork as she said. It is the always like uh, the, the, when you when you get together, you discuss about patients, radiologists, and you meet radiologists every day. You discuss about patients and the, the management, um, the, the management decisions we take at uh, consultant launch. Actually, we don't have much time to stay there, but anyway, when whenever we happen to go there, we discuss patients. Uh, and decision yes. comes there very easy. Very easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, there is uh, no formal referrals as such. No, no. no. Say you you sort of uh, go to the other consultants' quarters in the evening to drink some water, and then uh, you sort of invariably come to this discussion, Majandi, what is happening to this case and all that. Yes, and uh, when I was at Mayangana, though it's a sacred area, the surgeon and I used to go to uh, fishing uh, in that uh, lake. So there you uh, discuss what is happening in the hospital. Yeah, so that, that's true. In consultant lodge, uh, if we see a difficult cases, we always, uh, we say, so today we saw that patients or pediatrician, uh, all specialties are there. So they all give input. So very, very easy for us to manage this patient. Uh, so it's a very good thing uh, rather than, in, uh, I think uh, if you work in uh, major hospitals, you don't get that uh, culture. You you need uh, proper referrals and all for managing patients. So uh, we work 24-7. 
uh, you know, there's no leave as a such because we can't refuse uh, somebody's call. We never switch off the phone, even in holidays and all, because uh, we can't refuse. It's like a consultant's uh, colleague's help. Okay, so I think uh, we are managing peripheral hospital very, very, and very easily. And uh, shall we show our appreciation for some of the peripheral physicians who work tirelessly for the betterment of our patients? Thank you very much for traveling so many hours from Kandy. And uh, unfortunately, we could not uh, make that uh, highway. Uh, but yeah, it will somehow happen one day. <laughs> And thank you very much for coming and doing this today. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.